Welcome to Talking Hope, breakthrough conversations about preventing, treating, and curing cancer. Brought to you by City of Hope, an NCI-designated comprehensive cancer center. Hope lives here in Orange County. Hello, I'm Darren Godden, Chief of Staff for City of Hope, Orange County, and this is Talking Hope. Today, I'm talking hope with Allie Bertacchini, and our focus will be on survivorship from a mom's perspective. Welcome to the podcast, Allie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're so glad to have you. So you're a busy mom with, with, uh, with family and a career. Um, tell us more about yourself and your family. So I'm a mom of three boys. Um, they're currently ages 17, 15, and 11. Um, I'm also very involved in the, my community here and their schools and all of those things. And I also um, work for my husband as a financial advisor and I work doing marketing uh, consulting for him. Wow. So three, uh, two teenagers and one almost teenager that probably acts exactly. like a teenager already, right? Exactly. Yes. I've got two little boys, five and nine. And um, yeah, they're acting like that already too. So you have to give me some tips on how to parent when they get a little bit older. Um, well, thanks for, thanks for telling us that. So you're also a survivor with a story to tell. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about your cancer journey with um, breast cancer? Yeah, no problem. So my cancer came out of the blue. It was October of 2019. I had never been healthier. I had never felt better. And my body gave me one sign um, in June of 2019. I had a clear, I was, I was 41 years old at the time. I'd had a clear mammogram um, in June of 2019. And in October, I noticed when I got out of the shower that one of my left nipple had gone flat. But I thought because I am a busy active mom and I'm often in sports bras and all of those sorts of things that it was just kind of maybe from that. Um, but because I'm so, uh, tried to be so proactive with my health, I went and saw my primary care physician and she kind of gave me like a, well, I don't feel anything, but just to be safe, let's do a diagnostic mammogram and an ultrasound. And then just by, I guess, fate, the next day I was able to get in. And immediately I could see the technician's face and that they found something right away via the ultrasound. And then it kind of snowballed from there. Mm. Um, my cancer was unique from what I had expected it to be because it was never detectable by touch or by physical exam. Um, and it was like that it happened on my, my ultrasound biopsy and uh, diagnostic mammogram happened on a Friday. And I just knew that it was cancer. And I remember that whole entire weekend, just like crying and being so upset. And my husband was upset and we didn't know where this was going to take us and what was going to happen and all of those sorts of things. And it's like, your world just gets rocked. And not only are you afraid for yourself, but as a mom, you're so worried about your kids and how this is going to affect your kids and what's going to happen. Um, and at the time I had a eighth grader, sixth grader and second grader. Um, and it was like the most, I can't, it's just this feeling of everything is sort of control. You don't know why it's happening. It kind of doesn't make sense in your brain because you're like, I'm healthy, I feel fine. I don't feel ill. Like I, there's no like pain, like all of these mm -hmm. things. Um, and so I was with um, another provider than, uh, than City of Hope initially. And one of my good friends said, you know, I think just, even if it's just a consult, you should really consider going to City of Hope. So we, my husband and I, we went up and did the consult at the time it was up at Duarte. You guys weren't open yet. Right. Um, and we went up there and it was like for the first time I could breathe mm. because the moment I got there, the level of, I was like, no matter what's coming my way, I know that there's a team here for me. I know that my um, surgical oncologist was in charge of me at the time. And I knew that no matter what it was going to be, she spent so much time with me. She talked to me, she would text with me, email me, whatever I needed to make sure that there's someone always there with me and supporting me. Wow. Um, how long was that before you got to City of Hope after your diagnosis? Um, I was lucky enough that I was, I was diagnosed on October 15th, and I believe I went for my initial consult with her um, at the end of October, beginning of November, and then I had a double mastectomy um, December 2nd of 2019. Oh, and what did the rest of your, your journey look like after that, after the surgery? So I've learned a lot about breast cancer along the way, and one of the things that they do um, is when they do your biopsy, they can tell certain things about it. And depending on what certain things come back depends on the path that you're on. So my biopsy came back that I was HER2 negative, which meant that I was, it was not needed necessarily to go to chemotherapy right away. I had the option of going to surgery for either a double mastectomy or a lumpectomy first. Um, and then we, it was also found during my biopsy that my cancer was progesterone and estrogen positive. Mm. And being that 
I was 41 years old and it had been found within four months of my last mammogram. I was given the choice of a lumpectomy, but I kind of thought to myself, I'm, I know I'm young enough and strong enough. I want the double mastectomy. I just want it gone. I want to take as much proactive um, care that I could for myself. Um, and my surgeon fully, uh, fully supported me in that as well. Um, so I had my double mastectomy in December. And then when they do, when they do the mastectomy, they also then spend more time studying the, uh, the tumor after it's out mm -hmm. and they're able to give you something called an oncotype score. And the oncotype score takes into account your tumor, the size of it, what else, the, what other information they can find out about it, what your age is and what the, uh, what the, if chemotherapy would be beneficial at this time, like what your chance of recurrence is and those sorts of things. So I remember that it was right before Christmas. And it finally came back. So I think it took about three weeks and it came back that, um, I wasn't, it wasn't necessary for me to do chemotherapy at this time, which was a huge relief to me. Um, and then I spent the next, you know, it took me about six weeks to recover. And one day before I was out of my recovery, I noticed that my cancer side, my left side, that it was a little bit red. And it was like this, I had this feeling where my hands and feet were really, really cold. And it was like the first day, like my kids are back in school. It was like the first day I'd driven them. I was like, I'm back, I'm back. And all of a sudden I was like, gosh, I'm so tired. Like what's happening? I never had a fever. Um, but that next, and I kind of felt weird all night. And I was like kind of Googling at night and everything. And then the next morning I told my husband, I'm like, something just doesn't feel right. And it almost felt like I can only liken it to when you're a mom and when uh, you're a new mom and the feeling of when your milk comes in, which is kind of that swelling feeling, which obviously wasn't happening for me. So I had gone to my physical therapist that morning. Um, she was specialized in breast cancer and I was there for my appointment. She's like, well, it just looks a little bit red. Let's just look at it. And by the end of it, the redness had spread and I was rushed to emergency surgery oh, and wow. I ended up with an infection. And so I dropped my kids off. I could, I could still cry talking. About this. I dropped my kids off at school that day, thinking that like everything was normal and fine and I was going to be there. And then I was gone for five days while in the hospital while they studied my infection and did the infectious disease and all of that. And it came on with a pick line, mm -hmm. which was um, in my left, bi or my right bicep, because I can't do anything on my left side, my right bicep and was a direct line to my heart to get medication and IVs and um, around the clock for, I think it was four and a half weeks. Um, and it just mentally was so tough. I mean, I, again, I was, I always ended up kind of on like the top of the worst list, right? Like mm -hmm. I had cancer, but it was cut early. And then I did this, but it was cut early. I got an infection, but it was cut early. Like all these things, but I was like, the finish line just kept moving for me. Um, and so then I spent that another six weeks recovering again, because I was, had put in surgery and then the, the IV. Um, and then finally in March of 2020, I was like, okay, great, here we go. I can go back to myself. And then the world shut down because it was right. COVID. <laughs> so it was like another mental, like I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, you know, I just couldn't get away from it all. Um, but the end, and during this time, I was also, I had been passed from my surgical oncologist to my medical oncologist, Dr. Wade Smith, who's um, in the Newport Beach location. And they, I was under their care and given um, a medication that I'd be on for 10 years um, called tamoxifen which is an estrogen blocker and helps my body not feed off of estrogen to create any more cancer. Okay. Um, so I was doing that. And then it was determined that uh, radiation was not necessary at that time either. Um, and in October of 2020, I had my final reconstructive surgery and it was about it. So it was almost a year to the day that the whole experience was. Hmm. How are you doing today? I am doing great today. I mean, it's still there mentally. It takes a lot. I tell people I, um, that cancer happens and you're like ready for the fight and you like go through it and you go through it and go through it. And you're like, just try to get to the finish line. The finish line keeps moving sometimes, but you're like, try to get to the finish line, try to get to the finish line. And then once you get to the finish line, then I think you actually grieve what happens to you because there's like, it doesn't seem fair. You're kind of mad. You're like, you're so sad. You're like, you're never going to be the same person again. Like all of those sorts of things. Um, and I'm lucky with the support of my family and friends and all of that, that they helped me through that. But it, um, it, you know, I'm coming up on four years this October and I can say that I'm doing great. I can do almost every physical activity I could do before. Um, and life feels somewhat normal around here again. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this idea of survivorship is really like focusing on, 
uh, your health and your well-being and kind of the other toll that a cancer journey takes on you, right? Whether that's yeah. um, physical or mental, emotional, social, financial. Can you talk a little bit about some of those impacts that your journey had on you? Yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, like I mentioned before, like there's just so much fear and so much unknown and being someone that's a mom and running a household and running your family, you're, you're pretty, you know, used to like being able to figure out the logistics and all these things and everything gets thrown up in the air. Um, I can tell you that my kids were way more resilient than I could have ever imagined. Um, mm. My oldest, who, the one who's now 17, he was in eighth grade at the time. There was times when, um, when I had those around the clock IVs and they were slow release, like my husband couldn't be there and it was my non, it was my dominant arm. So I couldn't do it. Um, like he actually helped me, uh, and administered those to me, which was incredible. And now here is a junior in high school and he's looking to go into the medical field, which I think is amazing. Um, and my kids were everything to me. My husband was so supportive and spent, you know, he used to be the one who, when if ever, anyone needed stitches, he wasn't going cause he didn't like blood and all of those things, but he became the best nurse, took care of me so much, helped me with, you know, drains and wound care and all of those sorts of things. Um, I think that he also afforded me the luxury of time to let me work through a lot of it. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that when you're given a diagnosis is everybody kind of comes out of the woodwork and they're reaching out to you and they, you know, some people are telling you really scary things and you're like, I don't need to know that. <laughs> like, oh, I know some of this happened to it. And they're like, please don't tell me. Um, but one of my friends up in Northern California, she's like, you know, I have this friend who I work out with and she's just a couple weeks ahead of me. Would you like to talk to her? And I was like, yes. And I was so thankful to talk to someone who wasn't in my inner circle, who I could ask all the questions to and who could also kind of tell me what to expect or things that I should consider asking my doctor about or kind of prepare myself for. Um, and she was wonderful. And I remember I was like, thank you so much. Thank you. You know, this is like, unbelievable. And she's like, don't worry, you're going to do it for someone else. And since I've come to the end of my, when, it, when, since I've been diagnosed, I guess, and then come to the end of my own um, treatment, I've talked to friends and friends of friends and people that, you know, from back in my past, from high school and all these different areas. And there's so many women that I've talked to and helped them through theirs and given them suggestions to and answer questions and try to help them navigate certain things or things that they should think about. And every single one of them is like, what can I do? Thank you so much. I'm like, just please do it for someone else. And so I think it's created this amazing sense of community. It's like one of those clubs you never want to be a part of, but when you're in it and you find the right people, it's amazing what, um, what kind of community and what kind of help we can all give each other. That's great. And some sense of responsibility to others as well, right? To, to really help them. Well, through. Yeah. I mean, when it happened to me and it was, like I said, so out of the blue, I happened to be incredibly involved in my boys school at the time. I was president of the PTO. And people heard how crazy my story was because it was a little bit public because I was, I had to step back from some stuff. And there were seven other women that year that went to the doctor because of my story that were diagnosed with breast cancer. Wow. Wow. And like, it was, and I mean, I guess if that was my role in it, that they were supposed to then go take care of their own health. That's amazing. But it was just like one of those things where I was like, this is just everywhere. It's not going away. And I think being so proactive and so on top of it has helped um, breast cancer so much. Wow. Um, what does hope mean to you? And, and what is it personally, what personally gives you reason for hope? Um, I think for me, hope is something that when you're at your darkest of your dark and you're scared and you're so um, nervous and all of those things, it's something to hold on to. Um, I'm also a person of faith, so I hold on to that as well. And I feel like they go pretty hand in hand, hope and faith together. Um, and I think that it's something that you just, you don't know how much you need it to keep yourself positive and to go forward and all of those things until you really need it. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. A um, couple of rapid fire questions for you. Um, yeah. Going back to the, the beginning, you said something. You said, I was young enough and strong enough. I knew I could go forward. Mm -hmm. what, what made you know that? Well, I kind of know I didn't have a choice, right? Because I had these three boys that I know that they needed me. Um, and I also, I mean, I was a little bit mad. Like, I was like, I can't believe this happened to me. I'm like, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to beat this. And I think that I was just like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I know I can do this, you know the day, like right up into my surgery, I could run five miles or do it. Like I was, I was, I was an athlete. Like I was like, love to work out. I love to be active. I love to, you know, hike and bike and ski and play tennis and all these things. And I physically always felt so strong. So I think that I felt like maybe leading up to what was going to happen to me at this point in my life, 
I had spent so much time working on um, exercise and keeping my health physically healthy, myself physically healthy. Gotcha. Gotcha. Also, um, uh, we know that breast cancer doesn't just affect moms, but today we're talking with you, a mom, um, and you sound like a great mom, by the way, um, and as a mom who's been on this journey. So what is your message to maybe some of the other mamas that are listening right now? Um, I would say that I know throughout so many different phases of being a mom, life is so busy that sometimes you put yourself on the back burner. And I think not only if you ever notice any little tiny thing that looks different or seems just a little bit strange in your body that you didn't notice before to go have it checked out, even if you're told it's nothing, it's fine. Um, Cause you never know what's going to happen. And if you could be, you know, saving yourself, your saving your life or saving yourself from a worse diagnosis down the way. Um, I also think it's really important. And I learned a lot because I was always so on the go that you have to give yourself time as a mom for no matter what you're going through to actually take time for yourself and actually work through um, emotionally what might be going on in your life at that time. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, my, my wife's an incredible mom, I think, um, but I, I do see where she gets so busy taking care of the kids and the family that she probably doesn't take enough time for herself. And I think it's a great message that people need to hear that if you ever think you have something, stop, pause, and and, and do what you got to do to make totally. sure everything's okay, because you just never know, right? Right. Uh, that's great. Allie, um, before we close here, I just want, I want to ask you one more question. What did you learn about Allie the most throughout this entire journey? Uh, I think that I had always been the kind of person that could just always get things done. I'm like, I got it. I can do this. Like, no matter what, I'm a problem solver. I'm a logistics person. I'm like, you tell me something, I'm like, I'll figure this out. No problem. No problem. And I think that one of the hardest things was actually accepting help from other people and letting other people do things for me. I mean, I had an amazing amount of support from my kids' school and from friends and family. I had one mom, one of my good friends who for six weeks. And then when I was back in the hospital and it happened again, so for 12 weeks, she's like, I'm just going to make lunch for all three of your boys every single day for school. And I'm like, no, 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 I'll just order. She's like, no, I'm going to do this. And I was like, and that was like, there's so many things or people bringing dinner or driving my kids or all of these things. And it was accepting and allowing others in to actually help you is a hard thing to let go of. And I talk about a lot with when people in the first diagnosis, they're like, no, I got it. I'm like, but you don't have to, like, you're actually able to do it for others. And we all know when you are helping someone and you're on the other end of giving the help, not receiving the help, how good it feels. And I think letting go of that and letting um, letting that into our lives was wonderful for all of us, for all five of us. And I also think letting my kids actually show me how resilient and how independent they could be at the ages when you know I was still doing everything for them or as much as I could um, mm -hmm. has made them stronger as well. Right. Well, thank you so much, Allie. We really appreciate you sharing your story with us today and encouraging others and giving hope to others. Um, we love that you're advocating for others and getting them out there and getting them aware of um, what they should be doing. So thank you so much for sharing today. And um, thanks for talking hope with us. Um, thank you all for listening. I hope you'll join us again soon. I'm Darren Godden, and this is Talking Hope. Thank you all for listening to Talking Hope, where breakthrough conversations about preventing, treating, and curing cancer have been brought to you by City of Hope, an NCI-designated comprehensive cancer center. This is the hope you've been waiting for. For more information, visit cityofhope.org forward slash OC, or make an appointment at any of City of Hope's five Orange County locations, including City of Hope Orange County Lennar Foundation Cancer Center, the most advanced cancer treatment center in Orange County. Call 888-333-4673. That's 888-333-HOPE.